Welcome back to Bible Shorts, episode 138. Abram rescues Lot. In our last episode, we began learning about a man called Abram, his wife Sarai, and his nephew Lot. Abram, Sarai, and Lot moved from a city called Aran in northeast Mesopotamia to the land of Canaan, the land that eventually would become Israel. And last week, we left Abram and Lot moving away from each other since their animal herds were too large for them to continue staying together. Abram stayed in Hebron near the Oaks of Mamre, and Lot moved east to the Jordan Valley. So now, let's pick up their story in Genesis chapter 14. According to the biblical account, the Jordan Valley was subject to ked Erlamer the king of Elam. His vassal territory included five small city-states, Sodom, Gomorrah, and three other cities in the Jordan Valley. The local monarchs of these city-states were servants of the Elamite king and paid him regular tribute in order to pay him off so he'd leave them alone. In the 13th year of their oppression, the five valley kings rebelled against their oppressor. In response, Kederlamer formed a coalition with three other regional powers, several from the area of Sumer, the third possibly a Hittite ruler in what is now Turkey. Though the footnotes in my study Bible say that these kings cannot be identified in non-biblical sources, apparently there are fragments of tablets in the British Museum, which some scholars argue mention King Kedolamir, King of Elam. In any case, according to Genesis chapter 14, Kedolamir and his allies marched on the Jordan Valley determined to beat the rebels into submission. After the invaders rampaged up and down the area, the five kings finally took a stand in the Valley of Sidem, somewhere around the Dead Sea. In any case, the five kings of the valley are defeated. Now, the Bible tells us that the Valley of Sidem was full of bitumen pits. Well, bitumen is, is a sticky petroleum-like substance and today, we mix it with sand to make asphalt to pave our roads. Well, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell into these bitumen pits, and the rest fled to the hill country. However, I found out that physical evidence for the existence of bitumen pits around the Dead Sea is practically non-existent. But when the Dead Sea water level is low, as it is nowadays, Large expanses of black mud covered with a carbonate crust are exposed along the coast of the lake, and the black mud re resembles asphalt in its shiny black color and sulfurous smell. Thus, this biblical description may be of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fleeing through the mud flats where the lake level was low and sinking into the black sulfurous mud. Or maybe there were bitumen pits. Who knows? So the enemy took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who lived in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. Then someone who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living in Hebron by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite, Abram heard that his nephew had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Dan here is an anachronistic term added later by one of the Bible's early editors. It refers to the furthest northern point of ancient Israel, the location to which the tribe of Dan later migrated. Abram divided his forces against the invaders by night, he and his servants, and routed them and pursued them to Hobah, 
north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the goods and also brought back his nephew Lot with his goods and the women and the people. This portrait of Abram in military action departs from his normal behavior that we read about in other stories about him in the Bible, but it does depict Abram as a man of substantial wealth and considerable power since he can gather 318 trained men from his household to go with him to rescue Lot. Abram's pursuit goes to the far northern border of Canaan and then even past Damascus, underscoring the links in which Abram gave to this rescue operation. After his return from the defeat of Caterlamer and his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram at the King's Valley, an ancient area located on the eastern side of the city of Salem, which is now called Jerusalem. And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. He blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand. This is the only section of Genesis associating Abram, Isaac, or Jacob, the patriarchs, with Jerusalem. And in fact, it's the only place in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, where Jerusalem is referred to by name, albeit in its shortened form, Salem. Abram receives the blessing of the priest in what will become Israel's royal and religious center. Melchizedek is one of the most mysterious figures in the Old Testament. He appears both as a king and a priest. He uses the name El Elyon, God Most High, to bless Abram. El was the chief god of all the people of Canaan and was sometimes referred to as El Elyon, but writers in the Old Testament also used El Elyon, God Most High, to refer to Yahweh, mostly in the Psalms and Genesis. And then we learn that Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything, what we call a tithe. And the Jewish readers of Genesis might be reminded of the first tenth of the harvest that was consecrated to God and given to the Levites, the tribe that after the Exodus was set aside to be priests and caretakers of the tabernacle and its furnishings. Melchizedek is referred to as the founder of a royal priesthood in an ancient Jerusalem psalm, Psalm 110, verse 4, which says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Then, much later, in the New Testament book of Hebrews, the author will interpret that line in Psalm 110 as referring to God's Son, Jesus, as the true eternal high priest. And I also wondered, Melchizedek brings bread and wine, just like the Lord's Supper. Hmm. Then the king of Sodom says to Abram, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to God Most High, maker of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, so that you might not say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Oner, Eskal, and Mamre, 
let them take their share. Well, Abram has already given Melchizedek one-tenth of the loot, so he's just making sure that the king of Sodom isn't trying to make him feel like he's doing Abram a big favor. Taken alongside the narrative of Abram as a foreigner living among potentially hostile outsiders, it portrays Abram as a migrant seeking recognition as a legitimate resident dependent on no other. What happens next? Look for Bible Shorts, episode 139. God makes a covenant with Abram. Thank you.